This conference will now be recorded. So welcome everyone. Uh, we're all in different places and uh, it's wonderful to see you all. My name is Karina and I am a lifestyle medicine coach here at Ethos Primary Care. Um, here at Ethos Primary Care, we practice a lifestyle medicine approach that connects human health to the natural world. Our focus is on the reversal and prevention of disease, including the use of mindfulness and self-awareness to relieve suffering. The Ethos Primary Care practice is located directly on a farm, giving our patients a full 360 degree experience of lifestyle medicine. We grow regenerative organic produce, protect the earth, heal the soil, educate the community, and practice primary care medicine on a spectacular 280 year old working farm in Long Valley, New Jersey. So I just wanted to let you know what tonight's structure would look like. Um, we are just so lucky to be joined uh, by Dr. Ron Weiss and Dr. Judd Brewer. We'll be having a lively discussion followed by a generous Q&A. Um, so we're hoping that as you think of your questions, you'll be able to type them into the chat bar along the right of your screen and we'll be happy to answer as many of them as we can. Um, because of the size of our group, we're not going to be unmuting people for live questions, but if you can type it in, we promise we'll try very hard to get to you. So again, thank you so much for joining us. What a great group. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about Dr. Weiss. Um, Ron Weiss is a dual board certified doctor in internal medicine and lifestyle medicine. Ron is a primary care physician who serves as executive director of Ethos Primary Care and as an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Rutgers of New Jersey, Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. Dr. Weiss is not only a physician, but also a botanist and a farmer. He offers an evidence-based food as medicine approach to healing from chronic illness and optimizing wellness. He's been featured in top media, including the New York Times, the New York Post, the Today Show, New Jersey Monthly, and the feature length film, Eating You Alive. And now a little bit about our guest this evening, Dr. Judson Brewer. Dr. Judd is the Director of Research and Innovation at the Mindfulness Center at the Brown University School of Public Health, an Associate Professor of Medicine and Psychiatry at UMass Medical School. As an addiction psychiatrist and internationally known expert in using mindfulness training to treat addictions, Dr. Judd has developed and tested novel mindfulness programs for habit change, including both an in-person and app-based treatment for smoking, emotional, eating, and anxiety. In 2012, Dr. Judd gave a TED Talk about a simple way to break a bad habit. And in 2017, he wrote a book on the same topic called The Craving Mind. Dr. Judd has reached many during this pandemic with his popular YouTube videos that cover COVID-based fear and anxiety and how we can best control and manage our minds. We are just thrilled to have him with us this evening to talk about cravings, their purposes, and pitfalls. And one more person to introduce, um, my friend and colleague, uh, Asha Gala. Asha is the Lifestyle Clinical Director at Ethos Primary Care. She's a National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coach and also an MBSR, a Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Certified Instructor. Asha brings years of mindfulness training and practice to Ethos Primary Care, where she applies methods of awareness to help our patients overcome disease and improve health, vitality, and well being. And now that we're done with our introductions, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Weiss so that he can begin. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karina. Thank you. And, and thank you. Uh, Dr. Brewer, thank you, Asha, for uh, doing this wonderful webinar this evening. You know, um, I think maybe the place uh, I'd like to start off the discussion is just by letting our viewers know uh, a little bit more about what this lifestyle medicine is, 
because um, um, it's the newest medical specialty is the way I like to think about it. Just like there are dermatologists and there are orthopedists and there are cardiologists and gastroenterologists, lifestyle medicine is actually a, a specialty endeavor as well. And we use special uh, tools and we attend to patients in special ways in lifestyle medicine. And um, people seem to be confused when I tell them I'm a lifestyle medicine doctor. They mean, do they ask, do you mean um, an alternative medicine doctor? Do you mean an integrative medicine doctor? Do you mean a functional medicine? And I say, no, uh, I'm a lifestyle medicine doctor. So I think maybe the best way I can explain to our audience uh, to get them to really understand is to how this is so different is that when when we go to a, a, a regular doctor practicing medicine the way I think about it is it's the doctor who's doing most of the work the patient is rather passive in most instances uh, where you go to a problem you go to the dermatologist you have a rash the doctor has to diagnose it, give you a prescription, you take the medicine, you use the cream, the rash goes away. The same thing with high blood pressure or diabetes or other chronic illnesses. Generally, they are, uh, you're given a medication or procedure or surgery, uh, but it doesn't really require you, to, you, the patient, to do much to change the outcome of your illness. And that's very different in lifestyle medicine. Because really, what lifestyle medicine, uh, the premise rests on, is that there are seven, well, there are six pillars. In ethos, ethos, we've added a seven. Um, but there are six pillars. Uh, uh, and these pillars, really, what they are, are human behaviors or habits that we really must engage fully in, in order to reach optimal health. What are these? human habits or behaviors. They are diet and nutrition. And when we work in lifestyle medicine, we specifically mean a diet of whole plant foods. It is fitness. It is stress reduction. That's three. It is social connection, four. It is avoidance of harmful substances, five. It is uh, restful and healthy sleep is six. And as we said, because we, a lot of what we do connects with the natural process and mother nature, it is connection to the natural world that we think is a priority as well. So as you can see, it's not just about taking a pill. And that's why when patients come to us with their issues, Mm, they have to change their habits and behaviors, and it is, um, it's, it's, um, it's not necessarily intuitive. It takes some elbow grease. And one of the first things we do is we often give Dr. Brewer's book for people to read, The Craving Mind. So I was just wondering, Dr. Brewer, if you can talk, just give us a little synopsis of what this wonderful book is about and what that has to do with people changing their habits to get better. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, that book was kind of born out of, uh, so as an addiction psychiatrist, I've been seeing, you know, just all the different ways that addiction manifests. And so, you know, the classic addictions are things like cocaine and heroin and cigarettes and alcohol and all that stuff. But it turns out that addiction is a, a much broader category. You know, in, in residency, I learned this very simple definition of addiction that's actually still current in the, you know, the American um, uh, Association of, of Addiction Medicine, where it's, you know, uh, continued use despite adverse consequences. And so if you think of that, continued use despite adverse consequences, this could be, this could be any behavior, you know, this, um, this this weapon of mass distraction, as Cornell West puts it, um, could be you know has been now showing that we get um, that people that texting is more dangerous than drunk driving, you know, as an example. 
So there's an example of continued use despite adverse consequences. When somebody's so addicted to checking their cell phone when they're driving, it, so there's there's one second. Let me sorry, Dr. John. Um, okay. Listeners, we would we would request you all to mute yourselves. Please mute yourselves so that everybody can hear. Please, please mute yourself. We can help Sorry, out. Dr. Jen. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> the so you know continued use despite adverse consequences actually really uh, uh, you know it helped me awaken to really all these behaviors that that can be problematic. And so as I was going through um, and actually shifting my career from, uh, you know, my PhD was in immunology, I studied molecular biology and actually how stress affects the immune system. I actually shifted that to looking more at, you know, how we can actually change behaviors because, you know, we don't have great treatments for addictions and, it, and it's not just limited to the, the classic ones where, you know, it's, it's cell phones, it's, um, we can get addicted to, to distraction. Right. We can get addicted to the news. We can get addicted to thinking. We can even get addicted to love. And so actually the first half of my book actually outlines the neuroscience underlining all underlying all these different types of addictions. So we, you know, classic addictions, addicted to thinking, addicted to distraction, addicted to uh, I have a chapter called addicted to love. So that kind of lays out the problem that helps people kind of understand where this comes from. And not that you know addiction is just something that happened that makes that's bad. It's actually born out of a normal survival mechanism, which is challenging for folks. We can go into that later. Uh, the second half of the book actually details a bunch of the research that my lab's done, not only to understand the neurobiologic mechanisms of how habits and addictions form, but what uh, how we can actually target those from a mechanistic perspective. And it turns out. The mindfulness training is uh, is one, if not the best way, to directly target these uh, these core addictive mechanisms to help people break you know break bad habits. This is an example, and we can go into more of this if helpful. You know, we did a study with smoking. We found that mindfulness training uh, was five times better than gold standard treatment at helping people quit smoking. Uh, we even developed, you know, we used. We use this where people were, you know, everybody's addicted to their phone. So why not deliver treatment right through the phone? Started developing app-based mindfulness trainings where we got 40% reduction in craving related eating. We got a 60% reduction in anxiety. You know, even in uh, we did a study with anxious physicians <laughs> where we got a you know 57% reduction in these clinically validated anxiety scores. So you know that book really was uh, was born from you know this need to really kind of lay out how addiction is more than just, you know, what you see on, in the movies um, and how it affects all of us uh, from, you know, that spectrum from, you know, healthy habits to unhealthy habits to, to addictive habits hmm. and what we can do about them. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, uh, extremely informative. We really get a good idea of the nuts and bolts of your book. And um, I would, you know, of course, as you heard and you know we we are our practice is in the middle of a farm and the reason why that is is because we place an enormous amount of emphasis on food and the right food to reverse chronic diseases so we'd like we're very interested in in highlighting that the aspects of food and food um cravings and addictions but uh, in a, in a moment but before we get to that, I just was wondering if you can talk something about uh, the four steps uh, that you mentioned in the past to that are useful to break a habit. Mm, yeah. Can you say something more about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the first step, you know, kind of is is just kind of seeing that we're on autopilot much of the time, where we're you know we formed a habit, let's say around eating, and we're not even paying attention, right? So um, the move, shifting from that, I think of that as kind of step zero even, you know, because that's kind of the baseline. Step one is just mapping out the basic habit loops around eating. And let's use eating as an example, because I think this will fit very nicely uh, for the folks on this call. 
you know, there are three core elements to a habit loop. There's a trigger, a behavior, and a reward or result. And so from a from a survival standpoint, this is actually what helps us remember where food is. So, you know, imagine our ancient ancestors on the savanna, they're out foraging for food. Uh, they they come upon a food source that they didn't know it was that, that was there before, right? So there's that trigger. The behavior is that they eat the food, they see that it's nutritious, and then the reward for their brain is that their stomach actually triggers this dopamine signal that fires in their brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So it actually helps us lay down what's called context-dependent memory. So we can remember the next day to go back and find it again, okay? So it's there to help us survive, find food. It's also there to help us avoid danger. We're on the savanna, we see danger. We learn, oh, danger's out, you know, saber tooth tiger, don't, don't go to that part of the savanna because it's kind of dangerous. And so we learn to avoid that. So we, um, these are in modern times have been described as positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So, you know, there's something pleasant in you, uh, you have this urge to go and do that thing again, that's positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement, something's unpleasant. And so you do something to make that unpleasant thing go away. They both, they share this core common aspect to both of them, which is craving. So, this dopamine firing is interesting because it goes from when we unexpectedly find some food or unexpectedly see some danger and that fires and says, remember that. And then it starts firing in anticipation of doing that. So it urges us to act. It says, go get that food, right? Or go, you know, avoid that place. And so that firing, that's where craving comes in. And it says, oh, go, go, go get that, go get that food, go get that food. Uh, so we can see how that works from a, from a survival standpoint. Now, that's the first step is just understanding. So now everybody understands this. The first step is helping people just map out some of these, what, what's an unhealthy habit loop, um, let's, you know, with food, but this can be with other things as well, and also map out what are healthy habit loops. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Step, step, so there was step zero. Step one is mapping these things out. Step two is really looking at that reward, uh, re uh, behavior reward relationship. So behaviors get reinforced based on how rewarding they are. So, you know, if we eat some chocolate and it's more rewarding than eating broccoli, or I, I think the, um, you know, the title of this, this webinar tonight is kale, cake versus kale. I love that, right? So to our survival brain, it says cake has, is more densely packed with calories. <laughs> You should just eat a bunch of cake. But that's only helpful when we're actually in threat of starvation. Now, in modern day, most of us have a refrigerator. <laughs> you know, there generally is not a food shortage. So, in fact, that old system that's in place that says, you know, get as many calories as you can um, is, is not, you know, it's kind of uh, twisted in modern day. It also because back in the day when we needed as many calories as we could get, there were no, there was no such thing as refined sugar or you know purified sugar or um, you know corn syrup or things like that, where the, you had these, where you could concentrate sweetness uh, in sugar and get rid of all the stuff that was actually helpful. So you know sugar in the form of fruit, not such a big deal, as compared to sugar in the form of you know just eating a bunch of cake. So what our brains look for is to see how rewarding something is. And what we have people do is explore how rewarding or unrewarding that behavior is. So for example, if somebody wants to eat a bunch of cake, we actually say, go ahead and eat a bunch of cake, but pay attention as you do. So you can see, you know, what's it feel like? Okay, a piece of cake, you know, piece of cake, tastes good. Second piece, well, it's still pretty good. Third piece, you know, and we start to see how, you know, when we when we overindulge, that's very different than having a little bit of dessert, for example. And what that does is help our brain recalibrate to see how unrewarding some of our old habits are. At the same time, that opens the space to find something that is more rewarding. And this is where step three comes in, where we're actually stepping out of these habit loops finding uh, what I call the BBO, the bigger, better offer. Now, um, for me, I, I've actually been vegetarian since college and I actually went vegan just over a year ago. 
Um, what I started to learn was that when I ate vegetarian food, and I'm not trying to you know, be a proselytizer, I'm just using an example here. When I started eating vegetarian food, I found that actually I felt better. I had more energy. Um, I could, you know, when I exercised, I could recover faster and all this stuff. And that compared to eating a bunch of meat, um, I could compare the two. And when I ate meat, I felt sluggish, you know, didn't recover well. When I ate vegetarian food, I actually felt even better. And so my brain started shifting towards just naturally preferring eating vegetarian food. And it was actually just last summer, I, for several years, I'd had Achilles tendonitis that I just, you know, from running and exercising, I just, you know, couldn't seem to shake. I tried everything, you know, massage, physical therapy, all this stuff. And I actually, um, I, I was on Rich Roll's podcast and we were talking and, um, you know, he, he's this, you know, ultra, endurance athlete actually was named one of the 25 fittest people in the world at one point. Um, and he is completely plant-based, you know, you know, basically vegan. And so I said, well, I'll just give it a shot. Within a month, my Achilles tendonitis was gone and it has never come back. And I haven't done anything else, you know, anything different. I actually stopped doing the massage and the physical therapy because I didn't need it. So there's, there's a bigger, better offer. Just an example from my own life where it's like, well, I could eat cheese. That was, that was a big thing for me. I love the taste of cheese. But when I compare eating cheese versus like feeling healthy, there are plenty of other things that taste very good. And so when I compare that, it actually, you know, it, it really doesn't take any effort not to eat dairy products. And so there's an example where from my own life, where I apply third gear by simply, you know, trying a different behavior noticing the benefits of that and then comparing that to the old behavior so those are those are the four steps step zero you know just knowing that there's a problem step one mapping out these habit loops step two seeing what that behavior result relationship is that cause and effect relationship and seeing how rewarding the old behavior is step three trying something else stepping out of that old habit and then finding that bigger better offer does that make sense it does it makes a lot of sense and um, I want to get back to <clears throat> one touch upon something that you said mm -hmm. um, in that um, you were describing how, you know, in your work, you'll, you'll actually give people, tell people, give them as much as they want and more so of the cake or the thing that they crave so much and ask, ask them to pay attention to what they're mm -hmm. doing. And, mm -hmm. and as they successively go through piles of cake or they keep eating, they, they begin to discover that perhaps as they become excessive, it's not really giving them the enjoyment um, that they were looking for initially. But what I wonder about is, is there a point where one can moderate? So for example, um, and there are many in, leaders in the plant-based whole foods world who, who have estimated that there is a point of moderation. Some of us say there is no point of moderation, but because when you introduce just one iota of this former, former food that you, would, that you would be so attached to, it leads to a decline in your behavior and return wholesale to the old dietary habits. But I'm wondering that if, if one were so mindful of what they were doing and paying attention, would it be safe to maybe have that one piece of cheese and surround it with all of the kale and all the broccoli you're eating, whatever, because you, know, you could still benefit from that hugely anti-inflammatory effect from the 98% of those, those greens that you're eating, your Achilles tendonitis, most likely would not come back. Or right. would that one sliver of cheese then bring about the discomfiture of uh, wanting it again tomorrow? Yeah, so uh, let, there are a couple of pieces that we could explore here. So for example, with cheese, you know, if I go out to dinner, you know, and you know, like once a month or once every couple of months and we go get Mexican food and they happen to put some sour cream or some cheese on my, you know, my bean burrito or something, you know, I, I don't, I'm like, send this back, you know, my head's going to explode. I just eat it 
and you know, I'm probably it, it you know probably gives me a little bit of a dip, like for a day or something, but it's not like my Achilles tendon I just comes back raging, right? So here, this isn't about, um, at, le at least from my own experience, it's it's not about forcing myself to be really strict. Uh, you know, a lot of my patients call this uh, food food rules and food jail, right? So they have these very strict food rules, these food laws, and then if they break those laws, they have to they put themselves in food jail and beat themselves up. None of that's helpful, right? Because they feel bad. Well, one, it's really challenging when they're tempted by X, Y, or Z. It just, you know, it's just really hard to restrain themselves. And then two, when they can't restrain themselves, they beat themselves up on top of it, which also doesn't help, right? So here, um, it, you know, with, with things like cheese and whatnot, I, I, you know, it's, it's probably better not to, <laughs> you know, uh, not to kind of be so rigid that it just feels like we're forcing ourselves because then we're missing out on like living life and, and being being calm and um, and relaxed. But with sugar, it's interesting. Um, and I can also, <laughs> I've gone through all this myself, so I can <laughs> use examples from my own life. I remember um, somebody bringing, this was maybe a year or so ago, um, some friends, we had we had some dinner with some friends and one of them is a very good cook. And he brought over some home baked uh, chocolate chip cookies, right? And so, you know, I'm like, eh. he baked them specifically for us. They smelled fabulous. I ate, so I ate a chocolate chip cookie and immediately I was like, oh, I want another one. And that is really different. That is really different than when I eat. Um, so, my big thing for dessert, I love like, you know, anything that's above 70% dark chocolate. You know, and apparently you you probably know this better than I, but I think anything about 70% is considered health food because you can't fit enough sugar in that last 30% to make it not, you know, to to negate all of the goodness of dark chocolate. So I won't slum it past 70, you know, below 70, never into the 60s, whatever, because it just doesn't taste good. But it also induces that that er where this sugar thing that says, ooh, sugar, get some more. So I think there's something in there in sugar itself. That just drives that dopamine system that says go get more sugar go get more sugar now it doesn't mean that that's a problem if we're paying attention right so you know i've done mindfulness training for a while what i can do is notice okay here's this one cookie it's not going to kill me oh and here's this urge to eat more cookies the other part of that that i can notice is that urge to eat more cookies actually takes away from the benefit of enjoying this first cookie so it's not actually even that rewarding to eat a cookie because there's all this crap that comes after it that says, you know, gives me this restlessness, this- uh, Cookie monster. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> exactly. That dude doesn't even chew, right? All his teeth have rotted out. <laughs> yeah, that's so, funny. <laughs> yeah, so there, you know, even looking, so I think I would put sugar in a different category than eating, you know, occasionally eating, say, a dairy product or something like that. Yes. Can, because can sugar I... itself really drives that. But that being said, when when we can notice what we get from that, and when when you when we eat, you know, more, especially when you know, when I eat two or three cookies, I feel you know, and I I have trouble sleeping, and then I wake up like I feel like I have a hangover in the morning. If I pay attention to all of that stuff. That puts me back into that step two that I talked about where I can actually learn from it. And I can, I think of this as whenever I do something like that, I can bow to it as a teacher. I did it. What can I learn from it? And if I can learn, oh, I get this stomach ache and I just want more cookies and I don't actually feel that good. And the second one doesn't taste any better than the first. I could have stopped at one. It's much easier to remember that and then stop at one or even stop when given a choice, stop at none. Hmm. You know, where it's like, well, cookies are dark chocolate. Well, to me, dark chocolate, it, you know, it's, it's the obvious, it just tastes better. And I don't have all of that other stuff afterwards. Now we've actually done studies with this. Um, so I think of this as, you know, there's, there's a whole um, scientific literature that's been published on this for more than 40 years now. Uh, it's called these, these uh, Rescorla-Wagner learning curves where basically, you know, um, the we're going to repeat a behavior based on how rewarding it is and how we re how rewarding we re remember it to be. And what we've done is that we've we've embedded mindfulness practices into these app based mindfulness training programs so that we can actually measure how that reward value drops 
as people start to pay attention when they eat, whether it's overeating or eating, you know, let's say the junk food, let's put it in, just call it that category, you know, uh, you know, that's, you know, like, um, refined sugar, you know, uh, uh, you know, processed foods, things like that. So within 10 to 15 times of people really paying attention when they consume that way, that reward value drops not to zero, but below zero. Below zero. Flips. Yeah, below zero, where they start to prefer not eating it over eating it. And the key there is they, they're not forcing themselves not to do it. They're simply tapping into this, this natural reward system in their brain, because if they're not excited to eat something, they don't have to restrain themselves from eating it because their brain says, why would you do that? You know, when you can have, you know, for me, uh, it was gummy worms versus blueberries. <laughs> when I really paid attention, when I ate gummy worms, they kind of tasted like petroleum. Like when I really <laughs> paid attention and they gave me that sugar rush and I would have to eat the whole bag in one sitting because I knew I wouldn't be able to control myself. This is even after years of mindfulness practice, right? It was like, that's how addictive the sugar was. But then when I, I saw that, I was like, wow, this is just not very good. And then I would just compare that to eating blueberries. It was so easy. I can, I can have gummy worms in my house now because I'm just disenchanted. I'm just not that excited to eat them. And I have a bunch of blueberries in my house whenever I can, especially when it's blueberry season, because it just tastes so good. And I don't overindulge, right? Because I, I stop when I'm full. The fiber is there to fill me up and it says, okay, you know, that's enough for now. You can have some more later. Does that get at your question? That that does very well. I was wondering if I could, you know, I share my own bugaboo with you. And my uh, kryptonite, as as many of my colleagues at, at on the farm know, is a, a beautiful uh, thin crust pizza. <clears throat> I, you could put a filet mignon in front of me. You can put the finest wine in front of me, it doesn't really matter. But a piece of cheese pizza was always, for many reasons, was always my go-to thing. And when I first began, when I first uh, dove in and completely adopted a whole food plant-based style to die to the exclusion of everything else, I did it for a little while. And then I thought to myself, well, but I love this so much, why can't I moderate? Mm -hmm. I can have, you know, I don't want to have it too much, but I can maybe set some g guidelines for myself. I'll have one piece a month. It was like, I really w was putting myself in this, in the state penitentiary of, uh, of, of um, deprivation by just giving me myself a furlough for once a month. And what I found out was that the once a month turned into one slice once a month, two slices once a month, two slices every two weeks. Over a few months, it started soon, it was every week. And then I got to a point where I found myself on Christmas Day, nonetheless, <laughs> with my family, where I came to a situation where I tried to steal a piece of frozen pizza, kosher, nonetheless, from which was six months old, from a child who had nothing else to eat. I was contemplating this. And I realized in that moment, I, I, I stepped, back from, stepped back from the pizza and I realized who I was mm -hmm. and how this pizza was controlling me. Yeah. And I had never, I felt so deprived that I couldn't have this. Yeah. And I, yeah. I tried to make all kinds of, all kinds of excuses. Oh, but you've eaten a pound of kale every day for seven days. It's okay. You can have this moderation. And what I discovered in that moment is that I decided just to not have it at all from that point on. And I went a long time depriving myself of that. And what I began to realize is after a year, I didn't care anymore. I, you, can, you can 
And I imagine, I, I've never been a drinker or a smoker, but I imagine this is what like a, like a chain smoker who's quit for 10 years is like, where you know, they can go into a group of people smoking and they know that they used to have this problem, but they just will not light up. They don't have the desire to smoke. Mm -hmm. And I feel as if I had not, for me personally, if I had not had that rigid self-imposed mm -hmm. exile from the pizza, oh, wow. you know, I, I would still be eating pizza today, which is something in, in, wow. in perhaps an uncontrolled manner, unless of course I became so extremely mindful <laughs> that I could eat that pizza and then just stop there and be satisfied right. for another month. Right. What yeah. do you think about that? Of, of perhaps, I, I, before, even right. no matter how often I would have the pizza, I always felt deprived the next day because I couldn't have it every day. Right. And here, I don't find deprived anymore because I'm so removed from the experience. It's just, I just don't really care. Right. Right, right. So th there are actually huge parallels, uh, direct parallels between this and uh, the the two main schools of thought in addiction psychiatry, where there's this abstinence yeah. school where it's like you know anything that's not abstinence is wrong, and then there's this school of harm reduction, where it's like you know help people where they're at and help them help them start to see the you know what the behavior is doing for them um and i i don't i tend not to pick sides because you know it really depends on the individual it depends on the person and so for uh, let's just use your example when you can kind of get you know we call it sobriety right so let's say when you got pizza sobriety under your belt <laughs> if we can use that term if that's fair once you got enough pizza sobriety under your belt, that pathway in your brain was, you know, it, it not uh, not tickled enough where it's kind of it's kind of like a road that uh, cars don't drive down, and eventually the you know uh, the potholes develop and the grass grows through it, and you can it's hard to see that it's a road. It, you know, you can still drive down on it if you had to, but it's not it's not a pathway that gets driven down often. So that's what happens when somebody can develop that much, you know, pizza sobriety, and you can imagine how that works with, with other addictions. Um, now, the I don't want to say the problem, but the reason that there are other schools of thought is because it's very challenging for a lot of people to actually do that. And you probably run into this with your patients as well, where they're like, you know, they're like, Dr. Weiss, that's, I love pizza sobriety. I just do it right you know it's what is it um saint augustine who said you know please lord make me chaste just not yet <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think it was saint augustine right so you know it's like it's a great idea and some people can achieve it right and it's, and it's really great that you did and a lot of people really struggle with that so how do we help the folks that are struggling with that well, we can actually bring the two together. You know, there's this there's this middle ground there. So for folks that can't moderate um, or can't just go cold turkey or cold pizza, <laughs> frozen pizza. <laughs> well, <it's> frozen pizza. <laughs> um, this is where I say, well, if you're doing the behavior anyway, let's see how we can work with what's happening right now. And instead of trying to force yourself not to do something, just pay attention because you're doing it anyway, right? Mm. And we're all we all have the capacity to be aware so they don't have to do anything beyond just shifting a little bit to say okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna eat this why don't i pay attention and it's actually better if people pay attention anyway because they're gonna actually it, have the components that they enjoy you know people like they feel guilty about eating the ice cream or the pizza and so they sneak down late at night and they go like this they eat it really fast and then they bury it under the rest of the garbage in the kitchen garbage so nobody knows that they ate the whole thing and i have tons of patients that do that and i'm like so what was that like and they're like well i don't actually remember what it tasted like because i was so busy feeling <laughs> yeah. and, the trail. It. Yeah. <laughs> and sneaking it they, they didn't even enjoy it so what what i can what i have people do is this haven't played this game which is how little is enough Right. And so actually we had somebody, it was funny, this woman 
uh, we, we run this live group every week um, with these mindfulness programs and so people can ask questions. And this woman said, you know, I, I think it was New York pizza, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I, I'm trying to, it's, it was exactly what you're talking about. She's like, I'm trying not to eat pizza. I know it's bad for me, but it's, oh, I live in Brooklyn and like Brooklyn pizzas. Yeah, it was Brooklyn pizza. Brooklyn pizza, my favorite. It's, right. it's particularly good. And my wife's cousin, actually, uh, her husband has a Brooklyn, I think it's called, it might be called Brooklyn pizza. It's anyway. called Brooklyn's pizza. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's, it is dynamite. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's really good. So, so she's like this conundrum. And when she eats one piece, she needs to eat another, needs to eat another. It's like my cookies, right? So I said to her, okay, eat pizza, but pay attention with each, not just with each piece, but with each bite and look to see where that pleasure starts to plateau. And when it starts to plateau, really pay attention and ask yourself, you know, am I, have I had enough? Is this enough right now? And, and see how easy it is just to stop when, when you've hit that pleasure peak. And unknowns to most people, it doesn't actually take a lot, right? Mm. So I've had people stop at two potato chips <laughs> when they really paid attention. I had this, this woman, this patient, who used to eat a whole bag of potato chips every night. This is how she'd bond with her daughter. And as she started paying attention, she realized after two potato chips, it was too salty for her. She was done. So she would eat two potato chips and, and, and she'd bond with her daughter that way, but she'd stop every night and, and her potato chips lasted a lot longer that way. Yeah. So pizza, potato chips, ice cream, it's amazing. When we really pay attention, it doesn't take that much ice cream to satisfy and then it just, it hits that pleasure peak and then it starts to go downhill. And it's much easier to stop when we're simply paying attention, noticing and asking ourselves, how much is enough? And that, so that's the first step with the moderation. And then the next step is to compare that. So what's it like, you know, after you have, you know, three cookies or a bunch of ice cream afterwards, how's that compared to when you eat? I'm going to go back to blueberries because that's my go to when I have blueberries or um, lately, my wife and I've been eating um, just we've been sharing one mango for dessert. You know, we'll, we'll cut the nice fresh mango, cut it up and just enjoy. It's very sweet. Right. But I don't feel that urge to eat more. Um, so there, you know, is probably the, the fiber and all the nat, you know, it's just natural fruit. Yeah. There's something about that. That's very different than that sugar rush that comes from ice cream or that uh, car brush that comes from eating pizza. So that's where we start with the moderation piece and then can have people ship, you know, compare that to these other behaviors. And my guess is you feel pretty satisfied eating a whole food plant-based diet. So why look elsewhere if it's working, right? If it ain't broken. Definitely. And I think, uh, I know I, I see our lovely Karina on the screen, because I know we want to get to all the people of questions. Oh, uh, great. Google, but, you know, Asha, who is our lifestyle director and who's an MBSR coach. And just, I don't think we've, just for those of you who don't know what MBSR stands for, because I don't think we've mentioned it previously, it stands for mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, and uh, Asha, who we have with us now, is a certified teacher. I know that when we have patients who are with these dilemmas of eating, and we are, you know, because we are trying to change their dietary habits, Asha always works with them uh, using this MBSR to pay attention in the moment um, to change the habit of what they're doing, you know, with food, but also with environmental stressors and, and other things. Uh, and I think, you know, you've talked about that a lot, paying attention at that moment of eating, but that does work not just for eating, it works for other, uh, other stimuli, doesn't it? Hello? Are you, are you asking Asha or myself? Yes. Oh, well, Dr. Brewer and then uh, Asha, I'd love to. I'd yeah, I love to say, hear what I'll you said. over to Asha. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, after Dr. Brewer, because you're the you're the you deliver all of this at Ethos. Um, all I can say is I deliver because it has been very well designed by you know the whole mindfulness center 
Um, so I would say Dr. Brewer would be more of an expert. I yes. deliver whatever his teachings are. So I do use Craving Mind, uh, Full Catastrophe Living, Mindfulness for Beginners. All of those are like uh, a base for me to see where I can entice them towards mindfulness. Yeah, and I would just add just briefly that, you know, the, the MBSR program, you know, is, is uh, kind of was developed by John kabat in, in the medical model, you know, these eight weeks of a, of a course to help people really start understanding how their mind works. You know, in a nutshell, you know, a lot of, a lot of us don't know how our minds work and we don't know how automatic they are. John talks quite a bit about uh, autopilot, where we're just going on along life on autopilot. And it helps us wake up to what's actually happening, step out of autopilot, and step into participating in our own lives. Mm -hmm. yes, that's exactly, you know, and with Dr. Brewer, we're very excited actually um, to announce, you know, about this. Uh, our first MBSR program, we'll be doing our orientation very uh, first one, September 9th would be it. But, you said it right. It's about teaching them to pay attention. So yeah, uh, we're kind of bringing that to ethos. Right. Excited. Asha, I, uh, I wonder if this would be a good time for Asha to put up our MBSR slide, just so that oh, people yes. can see what we're talking about. Thank so, you, Asha. Rina. Yeah, I'll oh, definitely yeah. do that. Um, definitely, we'll do that. Asha. Asha is uh, opening up um, a slide to explain our new mindfulness-based stress reduction program that will begin in September. Um, and the great thing about mindfulness-based stress reduction is that it always allows for uh, a no-commitment first orientation. So uh, I thought this was so generous. I've taken it four times myself. And I always thought it was just incredible that they let you have a very information-packed orientation before you decide if it's right for you or if it's the right time for you. So we'll be doing that as well, and Asha will be leading that class. So um, in case you're having trouble seeing that, you can go to our website at ethosprimarycare.org. And um, it's one of our new signature programs. So, uh, so you can find the information there and you can register for the orientation. Again, no commitment. But, uh, but you know, I, when I first heard that mindfulness-based stress reduction was life-changing, I honestly was skeptical. And then after I went through the eight or nine weeks and then again, um, I saw what everyone was talking about. To be able to have a completely different relation, type of relationship with your mind and to be able to put space between um, an event and your reaction. Um, I found that it changed a lot of aspects of my life, not just eating, but interpersonal relationships, how I behaved at work, how I was with my family or my kids, even my dog. So, you know, there are a lot of benefits. Um, so that's what I just wanted to say about, about that slide. Um, there are some questions do you both think that we should roll into questions now? Would that yes, be a good please, idea? You, that would be wonderful. Before we do that, can can you just say a word about this uh, the Eat Right Now app that you have, Dr. Brewer? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. So we developed this app to um, you know meet people where they're at, basically. So I I was noticing that in my clinic, people don't learn to overeat in my office or to stress eat in my office. So was there a way to bring my office to them? So we took our evidence-based treatments and packaged it you know, in the form of an app where people get 10 minutes of training a day, uh, 30 or 28 core modules, and then a number of, of weeks of, of theme weeks that kind of build on those topics that basically you know, teach people these, these three uh, steps or these four steps that we were talking about earlier and give them um, mindfulness practices to bring to the moments that they are stuck, you know, when they have an urge to eat or when they're bored and they want to eat or, or whatever. And here, um, you know, we've done clinical studies on this, the study led by um, Ashley Mason at, at UCSF found a 40% reduction in craving related eating. 
So here, um, you know, we're we're developing these evidence-based treatments. Folks can learn more about that on my website, which is just drjud.com. Um, and the website for the uh, the app itself is Go Eat Right Now. Um, but it, it, all that information is is on my website. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we do we do have a question, uh, several questions. This one, the first one, I'd like you both to take a quick uh, stab at is the question that we often get um, or occasionally get when people of faith are concerned um, that the mindfulness-based stress reduction class may uh, or or concepts may interfere with. Um, with the way that they practice their faith or their belief in God. Yeah, I'd be happy to take a stab at that Thank unless you. you'd like to. Sure. Run. I mean, um, I have a comment because we do have, I, we do have um, people of, of um, a number of religions who, who have concerns about that, but I, I'll make a comment, but I'd like to hear what you say first. <laughs> So I'm actually married to a Bible scholar. Uh, my wife is a, a Hebrew Bible scholar at Holy Cross. Um, and I, you know, the way that I think about this, and if you look at it, so a lot of the, the core underpinnings of mindfulness practices are they come from Buddhist psychology. And uh, if you look at the teachings of the Buddha, they actually talk about, you know, suffering and ending suffering. And so he's often described as a psychologist or a physician um, and somewhere later because cultures tend to um, bring things together there uh, there became a debate a devotional element that was kind of added on uh, to the original teachings of the buddha so if you look at the core teachings they are completely um, completely secular in the sense that there's there's nothing religious there it's really a, a psychological teaching. Uh, so it's completely compatible with any religion. And actually, uh, I've had people come to me and say, it's helped them actually develop a, a deeper relationship uh, with God or with their, with their faith because they can pay attention to their reactivity um, and they can live more comfortably with themselves. Uh, so... You know, it's compatible with every, every single religion. There's nothing in there that says that anything against any religion, and in fact, uh, can help people uh, form a deeper faith, which is which is beautiful. Yeah, I I agree. You know, the patients uh, we've had a number of patients who have been who have not uh, wanted to be involved with the uh, MBSR, and I I feel that although they can't they can't articulate exactly why I sense it's because they believe that it's going to interfere with their the relationship, their spiritual relationship to the greater power. And what I try to tell them is that this uh, mindful practice just helps your relationship with yourself and helps you to manage your reactions and what, uh, what your behavior is, it, it really doesn't, it doesn't interfere with greater powers that you may have a relationship with. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, we do have, um, we do have those concerns. Yeah. Okay. We have another great question. Uh, towards the end of The Craving Mind, you provide a wonderful explanation of the differences between empathy and compassion and how over-reliance on the first can lead to burnout in our relationships. Um, if compassion is a healthier model for a long for long-term wellness, what role can or should empathy play in our lives? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think of empathy as you know putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And so here there's a component of empathy that actually um, is served in, in compassion as well. So compassio literally means to suffer with. So there's a, you know, if you think of empathy, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, and I, in my, in the chapter in my book, I use the example of physician burnout because this is also an epidemic. 
um, where if our if we're putting ourselves in our patient's shoes so we can relate to them and they're suffering, you know, they come to us not uh, often because they're sick, you know, we're going to be suffering a lot and so we can get burnt out. And in fact, um, we can start to form these defensive mechanisms against, you know, to protect ourselves. That's just normal. It's like, oh, I don't want to get burnt out. So we start to distance ourselves and then we lose that connection with our patients. If you think of compassion, so let me, let me put it, intermediate step here with mindfulness we can start to learn where we are taking things personally so if we are putting ourselves in our patient's shoes and we're taking their suffering personally then we're suffering and we're burning out but mindfulness can help us see we can actually put ourselves in our patient's shoes but not take that suffering personally to suffer with that's what compasio means so with a little bit of training, we can actually be with that suffering. And when we're not taking it personally, it actually opens up something that's entirely new, which is this, this movement to help. It arises, some describe it as effortlessly and uncontrived, right? When we see somebody in need, when we're not thinking about ourselves, what do we do? We automatically help. And that is limitless because we don't, we don't get burnt out from helping others. We actually get energized by it, right? Um, so here you can think of there's a, uh, empathy is kind of within compassion as long as we're not taking that suffering personally. And so in that sense, we get the best of, you know, uh, we're, we're not distancing ourselves, we're getting the best of empathy but we're also not getting the downsides of empathy as they describe it. We're not getting that empathy fatigue component. And the only tweak there is noticing what it's like to take it personally and noticing that we don't have to take things personally. So hopefully that helps the question. Beautiful, beautiful response. No, thank you. So helpful, really helpful. And, and, um, very, and very applicable. applicable for today's healthcare workers, right? In the pandemic who are suffering, you know, you read articles all the time, suffering greatly. So I have a question that came through from email. Um, do you believe that changes in our food over the past decade or so has made it harder for us to turn toward healthier food? And maybe doc, Dr. Judd first and then Dr. Wei second? Yeah. So I'll just say this briefly, because I'm sure Dr. Weiss has a lot more to say than I. There's a great article, I actually teach this in my course at Brown, um, from the New York Times Magazine, I think this is 2013, called, uh, I think, The Extraordinary uh, Science, the science uh, something about science extraordinary junk food, <laughs> the extraordinary addictive science of junk food or something like that. But in this article, um, and if you just plug those in, in in a Google search, you can find the article. In this article, they talk about all the different ways that food is being increasingly engineered to be addictive. And they use examples of things like Lunchables, right? Where it's like, you can engineer the convenience factor in for parents to be like, oh, here kids, you know, you can make your own lunch. As in, <laughs> you can buy this processed thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it and it relieves pain for the parents and the kids love it, you know, for a number, you know, it's sugar and it's also, you know, they feel independent. So they go through this litany, jaw dropping litany of all the ways that the food industry has increasingly refined their engineering to make these things more addictive. So I would say, you know, it started when we started refining things, you know, as humans, <laughs> We're great at refining, you know, it's like coca leaves, not a problem, cocaine problem, <laughs> you know, you know, we refine all these things, tobacco, you know, um, grapes. <laughs> yeah, right. All this stuff. And then it, it, it just gets more and more nuanced and more and more addictive, the more we learn about how to jack that dopamine system. So yeah, I would say, even in the last decade, that's really, uh, that that is continued. Yes, and actually, you know, for me, the the real jumping off point uh, was in the 1970s with uh, 
the policies that were put in 72, the policies that were put in place by Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture, who basically um, placed policies, uh, uh, enshrined policies in the Farm Bill and uh, Farming Policy in the United States that basically ran the family farmer out of business and insisted uh, that huge, vast monocultures of commodities such as feed corn and you know soybean be grown to make these processed foods and, and to 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 make these hamburgers to feed all these CAFOs where today these emerging zoonotic diseases are coming from. So um, that was a that was a huge inflection point, and and uh, I think. Really, you know, uh, I think in order to reverse this process, we've got to fix our agricultural policy in this country. But that's that's another lecture. Amen. That's another webinar. Well, we have a scenario that came through on chat. A family of five, a busy week, and everyone is exhausted by Friday night. And while we know we can order pizza without cheese, we still occasionally <laughs> give in to the craving mind, and whether that's with pizza with cheese or something else, um, even, though, uh, even though we know this, um, once we eat it, we immediately get stomach pains and we swear never again. <laughs> but that <laughs> Friday know. comes around again and, uh, and we are still tempted. Any suggestions? Take it away, Dr. Brewer. <laughs> that is a great scenario that I'm guessing almost everyone can relate to, right? <laughs> so here, one thing to play with is finding that bigger, better offer, that BBO. And so while pizza is, you know, can, can be ordered and it, it can be very convenient, right? Fortunately, there are increasing numbers of places that, that can actually offer, um, you know, uh, food that is that is healthy. You know, even whole food, plant based food that can be, you know, basically gotten on the go. So that that convenience factor um, can be met with that bigger, better offer. I'm thinking in I live in Massachusetts. Um, there's a uh, there's a um, chain a growing chain called Be Good where they get locally sourced food and um, serve, you know, basically serve, you know, healthy food. Uh, and so I can get, um, you know, I can just get a, they have a kale bowl that I like, but you can get veggie, veggie burgers, you know, all of this stuff, locally sourced fresh food that actually um, feels better, but also uh, meets that convenient factor. So if you compare them head to head, it actually, you know, it's actually more rewarding. So that would be something to explore as well. And also, you know, not that this is always easy to do, um, but a couple of other things to explore are, you know, there are tons of different meals that can be prepared in, you know, 15 minutes that are healthy. And often we think, oh, you know, all food plant-based, I'm sure Dr. Weissing can talk more about this. All food plant-based, boy, that's tough. That's hard. I don't know, you know, we can... <laughs> It's actually not that hard to do. And there are many ways that we can have very quick prep meals that actually taste really good and the family can enjoy in the time it takes to order and wait for pizza. So those are, those are just two examples, but uh, maybe there are other, other ways to explore this as well. Thank you. Karina, I know you must, knowing, knowing the expert you are, I know you must have something to say regarding. Yeah, well, I usually work with patients and discuss how uh, preparation is key. So trying to keep that frontal lobe part of the brain um, engaged. You know, there are certain states of mind, I think, where we are more likely to be tempted if we're tired, as, uh, as, as, as the question mentioned, if we're feeling angry or anxious or lonely. There are certain states of mind where uh, older parts of our brain will take over the things that we know from the newer parts of our brain. So preparation, I think, 
in those states is key. I used to say that, you know, when I first came to Ethos, I would put food in the front seat of my car, even just several apples, you know, just because if I was driving home from the farm and it was after a long day of work with Dr. Weiss and I was tired and hungry and I would probably eat anything that I could get my hands on. So if I could plan ahead, whether it was a quinoa salad in a cooler or just honestly a bunch of apples or cucumbers, if there was something I could eat, that that would help. And and I have three kids too, so I understand you know the family of five situation. But I did use the prep ahead and what Dr. Brewer said, you know, finding ways, places you could pull into along the way to get the convenience and the speediness of the food. So I thought both of your answers were great. Um, so uh, we noticed that, you know, you've really been helping Dr. Brewer a lot of people during this COVID-19 time. Um, we've talked a lot about food, but, uh, but uh, in your book, you also talk about how the brain can really get hooked on worrying. So I was wondering, and several of our listeners were wondering, is there anything you would like to add about the unique challenges of these past five months or so and some things that people can do to help with worrying? Uh, well, one, it's, it's, I could go on for a week and actually um, I have a book that will be published uh, the the publication date just came out uh in march 9th of next year that is specifically about anxiety and worry like the whole book um so if somebody really wants to get in into that in depth um get on my mailing list and you'll and i'll give send out reminders about when that book's going to come out um but in terms of uh you know the the myriad ways that worry and anxiety uh is manifesting especially now uh, the first thing I would say is just helping understand how this, you know, how fear actually can be when it's paired with uncertainty, and we have tons of uncertainty right now. This actually leads to anxiety. When you uh, add in things like social media, you know, when we don't know what's happening, actually information is food for our brain. So we look, you know, we go online, we start looking for news sources, we go on social media because that's often where people get news, and then they get they get hit with all this you know people panicking and so then we catch that social contagion and we start to freak out and it actually defeats the purpose of getting information so just understanding that is really helpful i've put out a bunch of videos on youtube um, that you know these short five to ten minutes that describe all the different ways that we, that anxiety is showing up and worry is showing up right now so if folks want more resources on that i would just uh, have them take a look at my YouTube channel, which is you can just search under Dr. Judd on YouTube. Um, so I would say, you know, just that basic understanding. And then if you want more information, you know, whether it's get addicted to news or, um, you know, anticipatory grief or, you know, mm -hmm. shame that we're not doing more or there are all these different things that show up. I'm, I've put out about 25 videos uh, just since March on that. Wow. Thank Wonderful. you for that. Thank you for, for that. So uh, here's a question for Dr. Weiss or Asha. So uh, to help transition someone from a standard American diet to a whole food plant-based diet, would you recommend a move the needle approach or would you recommend that they go 100% toward plant-based foods? <laughs> you go first, Asha. Okay. All right. Yes. And, and this is a perfect question that I know we tackled Dr. Weiss in our two week challenge. You know, we exactly kind of discussed this particular approach. We give people a choice, right? In the two week challenge, it's up to you, right? We're yeah. like Dr. Brewer, you know, you, you, it depends on the person, what your proclivities are. Yeah. I, and that's exactly, I would like to tell this person is we you know as dr brewer has constantly said if we really mindfully see where we are whether we are the people who can jump and change like that overnight then that's the person we are or if we need baby steps then let's do the baby steps because the destination is waiting for you you know i always say there yeah. is a destination waiting uh, you just have to get there and um, 
don't be frustrated uh, with those baby steps or with the quick steps. We all will get there someday. And I still feel I'm still in my own journey. Um, you know, like now I'm discovering this ocean of mindfulness. So that's the big part of my journey. The whole plant-based food world, I, you know, I kind of did that and then I found the pieces and connected it. Um, so Korea, I hope that was my way of explanation. And Dr. Weiss, if you can add something. Yes, well, you know, I agree with everything you're saying, Asha. I think that, uh, you know, there are, you know, of course, we love, you know, as practitioners, we love drama. <laughs> so when someone comes in who is so sick, it, it's like it's like we have a magic wand. If someone will just poof, transform themselves the next day by eating whole plant foods in a dedicated manner, because they are so powerful for many illnesses, from asthma to acne to lupus to Crohn's disease to diabetes, that they can literally overnight trans form or over a couple of nights trans transform or start to transform people so of course we never miss an opportunity when we find a person who we think is vulnerable to being a diver <laughs> instead of ripping off all their clothes and streaking down the football field we love people like that we, we take we try to encourage them and then the other thing i think about is Sometimes when a person is critically ill or very sick, sometimes they may not have the luxury of that time to have a year where they have to, you know, someone who's in kidney failure or someone who has cancer or someone who has a, a severe autoimmune disease. So for those people, sometimes taking a, a more um, aggressive approach is necessary. Thank you. Thank you. I, I definitely welcomed, uh, you know, reading Dr. Brewer's book again. And uh, my favorite part was really his explaining, his explanation of the reward hierarchies. And that was just so incredible. I, I've seen it work with, with my life too, and with the ethos methods as well, where if we're having people add more leafy greens and add more, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables during the day, you're changing what their preferences are and then if they're able to pay attention to that things like bread and muffins and candy and you know other types of foods even coffee with cream and sugar so many of our people come to us and that's a very big addiction as well so uh, if they can actually pay attention as you said so well dr judd um to what it really tastes like, tastes like, especially as they're adding in some of these cleaner, uh, more energy producing foods and then update and upgrade their reward hierarchies. And that's hands down my favorite part of this whole book. So um, is there anything else we should know, Dr. Judd? Nope, I think that's <laughs> it. <laughs> Not easy, but it's helpful. Okay, Dr. Weiss, anything else from you? Not to upstage Dr. Judd, nope. Okay, okay, I'd like to remind everyone that you can follow Dr. Judd at drjudd with one d.com and you can find Dr. Weiss at ethosprimarycare.org. Um, and we look forward to talking with you, uh, to share with your family and friends. This recording will be shared in probably two or three days. And uh, this was a really enjoyable evening. I can't thank you both enough. Thank you so much, Karina. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thank Dr. you, Karina. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.